Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Something for everyone today on Another View in our first half hour, Alternative Ways to Health. We'll explore ways to get well and stay well by understanding the mind, body, and spirit without the use of traditional drugs. In the second half of the show, a conversation with abolitionist, intellectual, former slave, and human rights leader, Frederick Douglass. You don't want to miss that. And we pay honor to a civil rights icon, Julian Bond. It's all on Another View, coming up next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we get started today, just want to say a very special hello to some special visitors in our control room today. My daughter Tiffany and my granddaughter Patience are here visiting me from Baltimore. So just want to say hello. They're here watching the studio and watching the show. Uh, I think this is the very first time that Tiffany's had to watch the show. So I'm real happy that she's here. So we've got a variety of topics for you today, including alternative ways to stay healthy, which new for Africana Virginia Beach 2015 and a conversation with Frederick Douglass, portrayed by poet Nathan Richardson. But first, Julian Bond's commitment to civil rights spanned the better part of six decades, from leading student protests in college in the 60s to eventually taking the helm of the national NAACP in the late 90s. Julian Bond led a life of service. Our Lisa Godley takes a look at his contribution to the state of Georgia, the nation, and the world. I woke up this morning with my mind on Bond became interested in politics while a student at Atlanta's Morehouse College. While there, he helped found the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, leading nonviolent protests against Atlanta's segregated parks, movie theaters, and restaurants. During that time, he traveled to Raleigh, North Carolina, to help form SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He left Atlanta in 1960 to serve as SNCC's communications director, a position he would hold for five years. He was later elected to the Georgia State Legislature, but his opposition to the war in Vietnam didn't sit well with fellow lawmakers who refused to swear him in. I'm of the opinion that our involvement in Vietnam is wrong, we ought not be there, we ought to disengage ourselves, and that there will never be decent treatment for minority peoples in this country until we begin to concentrate on freedom and justice and equality for those at home and stop worrying about uh, puppet dictatorships and despotic governments in Southeast Asia. It would take a Supreme Court ruling to allow him to take his seat. Bond served in the Georgia House for eight years and the Georgia Senate for 11. During that time, he wrote more than 60 bills, which became law. In 1968, at the Democratic National Convention, Julian Bond became the first African American to be nominated as a vice presidential nominee. But under constitutional guidelines, he was not old enough to hold office. We offer a nomination with the greatest pleasure, the name of Julian Bond. From 1971 until 1979, Julian Bond served as head of the Southern Poverty Law Center and as president of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP. In 1986, Bond ran for the U.S. House of Representatives but lost in a heavily contested race to another civil rights leader and former SNCC member, John Lewis. I think the experience of running and facing me in the congressional race made him stronger. I know it made me stronger. And our friendship was a little schism there for a while. But we became reconciled. And he still became one of my closest and dearest friends. 
not just in the movement during the early days, but later after I went to Congress and he continued to serve as the chair of the board of the NACP. Julian Bond served as chairman of the national NAACP from 1998 until 2010. Even after leaving office, his voice remained on the national stage as a commentator for NBC, a columnist for the New York Times, and a history professor at the University of Virginia, and American University. Julian Bond passed away on August 15th. He was 75 years old. That is a tribute to Julian Bond. And our condolences also go out this week to the Stokes family. Former Congressman Lewis Stokes of Ohio passed away this week also. He was a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus. And now let's move on to our next topic. Our ancestors used the fruit of the land and anything natural to ease the pain of a toothache, heal a cut, bring down a fever, or soothe whatever ailment at hand. They also ate fresh fruits and veggies without pesticides and meat that was not filled with antibiotics. There is a movement today to get back to the basics, get back to natural health. And here to talk to us about it is Dr. Erica Steele, a naturopathic doctor doctor. And I probably didn't say that right, Erica, did no, I? No, you did. You did really well with that. <laughs> How are you? Thanks so much Very for joining well. us Thank today. You for me. And Ms. Loretta Kahn, publisher of the Hampton Roads Gazette. Hi, Loretta. How are you? I'm fine, Barbara. Good. Thank <clears> you. It's so, nice to be here. Thank you so much for joining me today. So, Loretta, I want to start with you because the Hampton Roads Gazette, first tell us about your paper because there may be some folks who are unfamiliar. Okay, Hampton Roads Gazette is a six-year-old community service, nonprofit newspaper. Our mission is to link community service nonprofits with each other and those they serve, as well as to empower people to take charge of their health and that of our environment. Mm -hmm. So every August you do this health uh, segment, this health edition? This is, this is actually our first natural health edition, ah, but okay. in mm -hmm. every issue we publish at least two pages of natural health information. And why natural health? Why is that important to you? It's important for a number of reasons, but the thing is there's a great deal of sickness, especially in Hampton Roads, all over the nation, Almost everybody has a friend or family member who is suffering from some kind of disease. We want people to know that our bodies are designed to be self-healing and to help them learn how to bring their bodies back to the condition where they can heal themselves. Now, Dr. Steele, Erica, because yeah. I've known you, so we yeah, call each other on first name basis. Yeah. But there are some people um, who say, well, you know, it's very different from Western medicine. Let's just put it that way in terms of, of kind of this whole idea of incorporating the mind, the body and the soul in, in looking at, at a complete holistic way of looking at the body. So what tell us what the difference is between the way you practice medicine and a traditional MD would practice medicine. So um, there's a lot that you said in that. So let me break it down. So first off, um, we naturopaths, we do practice um, Western healthcare. So we look at anatomy, physiology, pathology, biochemistry. The big biggest difference is, is that an allopathic medical doctor diagnoses and manages a disease, a symptom. Okay? They, they chase symptoms in order to label them with a diagnosis. And then their methods of treatment are pharmaceuticals or surgery. Okay. Um, whereas the difference being with what, how I work with people is, is that I'm not looking to diagnose and manage anything. We're, we're not allowed legally to diagnose anything. And, and really it's not important, important because once you label something, then it's like, okay, good job. Now all the job, now, now the work is done. And, and that's not the case. Um, the body takes time in order for it to manifest uh, a disease, a breakdown of a disease. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for the causes of disease, whether that's environmental stressors, heavy metals, chemicals, whether that's immunological stressors, bacteria, parasites, heavy, you know, uh, viruses, 
mm-hmm. those sorts of things. Um, food sensitivities, food allergies, stress, our perception of stress, internal or external stress. So internal stress are the things that I just mentioned. External stress would be our perceptions of, you know, our boss or our spouse or, you know, how we feel in, in our environment and how we feel about ourselves. And so many people don't have, um, as Loretta had mentioned, you know, understanding and really understanding that they're able to heal themselves. We really have gotten far away from that understanding. We've, in fact, surrendered our power away over to some someone else, whether that be a doctor or whether that be a friend or whoever that is. And so with that, we don't take that self-empowerment, that initiative in order to uh, support our body's ability to heal itself. So can you can we use both you and a regular MD yes. and, com- and uh, combined yes. in order to deal with, with our health issues? Yes, because we serve two different purposes. So let's say, for instance, a person comes to me that has hypertension. Okay, I'm not treating their hypertension. Mm-hmm. The uh, allopathic medical doctor is going to have them on a litany of medications, which I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with. Um, I'm going to work with them on genetic risk factors, genetic variants, support those, help them with diet, lifestyle, really help them coach, manage their stress levels, um, add nutritional supports and things like that, herbal supports if necessary, homeopathic supports if necessary, to allow for their body to heal. Now, in conjunction with their allopathic doctor, our goal is um, hopefully, if obviously there's there's uh, an indication to do this, to get the patient off of that particular medication. But that's not, you know, there are some cases where that's impossible. And we respect that. You know, our goal is to um, get the person to the best health possible, not necessarily say, now you have to choose. That's why I don't really like the word alternative medicine because it suggests that you have to that choose. That you have to choose one or yeah, the other. Yeah, it's more complimentary. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. I know that we don't like to use the term alternative medicine, yes, but I, I think people understand what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. If you've ever done some other things besides what is considered traditional medication yeah. in order to get well, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Now, Loretta, you're holding a, um, along with a bunch of other uh, uh, folks, a natural health fair. And tell us when it is and what you hope to gain out of that. Okay, our Natural Health Expo is scheduled for Sunday, August 30th from 11 a.m. till 6 Mm p.m. It's going to be held at what is now called the Virginia Beach Norfolk Holiday Inn on Greenwich Road. Uh, The event will feature a variety of presentations by, um, well, we have a variety of, of people involved, everyone from an herbal specialist, a chiropractor. Uh, Dr. Erica Steele is one of our presenters. We have uh, Lindsay Gutierrez Mm -hmm. coming from New Earth Farm to uh, give a presentation on healthy eating for teens. So we're looking at at healthy eating. We're Mm -hmm. looking at exercise. We're looking at every aspect uh, that you can do. Yes. We'll also have fun physical activities like Zumba, line dancing, and two yoga sessions, one especially for teens. Oh, now why the emphasis on teens? The emphasis on teens is most teens at least to my knowledge, mm-hmm. are really hooked on fast foods. Mm-hmm. They have no idea of what the unhealthy ingredients in those foods are doing to their bodies. Mm-hmm. And most of us, when we're young, we we think we're invincible. So they don't see any evidence. Of course, if that they continue... They'll see it they'll along see it the road. Sure, sure. So, and and as young people are our future, so whatever we want, we feel should be learned should definitely include mm-hmm. teens. Erica, I noticed that a lot of times, and, and I've heard you speak on on many occasions, mm-hmm. and you focus out on the digestive system um, mm-hmm. often, and. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about why 
the digest it seems to me that the digestive system is kind of the the plumbing well it is the plumbing of mm-hmm. the body but it yeah. it's like the central point um of what ails us or or Mm -hmm. where we can find what is going on. Yeah, it really does. The digestive system is an amazing system. Um, It houses three of the major systems, uh, majority of the immune system, majority of the hormonal system, and a majority of the neurological system. Um, It also separates our inside world, internal world, from our outside world. So we eat something from our outside world, and then it goes into our inside world via the digestive system. And then our digestive system's they have to digest, assimilate, and process our foods and then disperse it throughout uh, the other organ systems. So it's incredibly important to keep a healthy digestive system, making sure that you're eating healthy, making sure you're digesting and assimilating properly. And even people that are eating a 100% healthy diet doesn't necessarily mean that they're digesting and assimilating that diet. Mm. So that's why there's a lot of confusion when it comes to um, the health of the person. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Let's say Jenny is calling us from Williamsburg. Hi, Jenny. You're in the air. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. And sure. I'm really enjoying this conversation because it's really key in understanding nutrition. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about um, when people are first going to a naturopathic doctor, they're having that experience. A lot of times they go with a a very last resort thing that they, that no MD can help them with. Mm-hmm. And it's really important that before they go, they really put it in their mind that they're still in control of their own health, that they can't take um, their first experience with a naturopath at face value. They have to really go with that in mind that they're still in 100% responsible for their own health in the sense that, um, you know, some naturopaths out there are, in different stages of their own experience with their their profession, and they may or may not have the you know exactly what that person's looking for, and mm-hmm. uh, they have to really evaluate the naturopath just as much as they would evaluate an MD. Okay, thanks so much for your call, Jenny. And she brings up a good point. What should you look for yeah. as you're trying to make a decision about going to a naturopath? You know, I I think. I'll say this. The first thing is is that um, naturopaths are often more scrutinized than an allopathic medical doctor would be. Um, I think some things to look for is connection with that particular individual and how that person feels. Going back to the gut, going back to that digestive system, we have an instinct in ourselves. We know when we're meeting somebody, we're speaking to somebody, if that person resonates with us or not. So that's first thing. Um, secondarily, you know, there's a lot of naturopaths that um, load their patients, meaning that they'll put their patients on a lot of supplements. Um, that's not something that I recommend um, because, uh, you know, uh, a poor diet can't be replaced by supplementation. Um, I'm also not really big on uh, a lot of testing. You know, there's a lot of naturopaths that do a lot of testing. Um, and a part of me becoming a naturopath too was I went to so many different types of, I always knew I was supposed to be a doctor, and I went to so many different types of doctors. And the thing that I didn't necessarily like about that experience, I then applied it in my own practice. So I wanted to make sure that I spoke to people and taught people because doctor in Latin means teacher. So I really wanted to educate people on their body, how it's supposed to work, how it's not supposed to work, and then inspire, motivate them through the process. So as you see people, is there one particular area or one particular thing that you find that you see over and over and over again that you'd like people to really think about or pay attention to that they could stop or or start to make a change in their own lifestyles now that you that they come to you at yeah. a point where if they had just changed you this know, thing I think I think that so when a person begins to develop a symptom the body's been manifesting that for a long time okay mm. so so symptoms don't come right away no They don't. Um, And and the thing is, is that people really, they wait. They wait so long. And then, you know, as as the caller was speaking about, they go to doctor after doctor. And then the last resort is the naturopath. And then they're like, give me a miracle. Well, naturopathic medicine is slow but sure. It's very much like grandmother energy in that sense Mm -hmm. that, 
you know, we're, we're really very um, definitive in our process. And so even though the patient may have this marked desperation, the reality is, is that the person has stayed this way for a certain period of time. So I think number one is maintaining an open mind just throughout life um, and being open to another view. <laughs> so I think that that's really important for a lot of people. And when they first start, feel, you know, when you wake up and you're like, you know, I just don't quite feel right. You know, that that's that's the first thing. And we all know eating fruits, vegetables, drinking water, exercising, all of that is the key to good health. And so if they're not able to do that, if you're not able to do that, then you kind of know why, you know, I think I need some support just to be able to know and understand how to live. You don't have to always, I have patients that are actually preventative, some patients that don't have symptoms going on. And those are my ideal. Naturally, that's probably 2% of my whole patient population (laughs) because most people, they wait until something goes wrong and then they're like oh my gosh let's fix it loretta one of the the big areas and and we've talked about this on another view often and that is um the whole idea of food deserts and how um there are certain sections um within particularly metropolitan areas where people really have a hard time getting fresh fruits and vegetables so as you work with nonprofits and as you work through the gazette are you finding that more nonprofits are working together to try to to ease that situation in terms of bringing fruit, more fr- fresh fruits and vegetables to uh, to various areas? Well, I don't know many organizations as such okay. that are working in that arena, but it's interesting you would bring that up because in maybe it was online this morning, maybe it was in the pilot, uh, Norview Five Points Farm Market, mm-hmm, mm-hmm is just uh, hooking up with the F, what is it, FNV FNV, movement, right, and... Fresh vegetables, and they're going to be bringing those vegetables to various neighborhoods, um, I believe is how that that movement goes. Right, they mm -hmm. they will operate Mm -hmm. a mobile... Van or uh, opportunity Mm -hmm. and and actually take fresh vegetables and fruits to neighborhoods. And that's supposed to start next week, if I'm not mistaken. Very soon. soon. Very soon. Right. That's coming up. Yeah, okay. they've been very instrumental in just helping raise consciousness and awareness in this area on eating healthy, especially for teens. And because mm-hmm. there's a lot of teens that, you know, are unaware of where our food comes from. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. they've really been very instrumental. Yeah. And so Bev Sell, who's yes, the uh, exactly. Love her. <laughs> general She's manager right. over uh-huh. there. Yeah, I uh-huh. remember her telling a story once of of, um, of a child uh, or someone working in the market, and they were so surprised with uh, potatoes because yeah. they they were saying they're dirty, and mm-hmm. they didn't realize that that's you know where put, where they exactly. came from. So it's such an education mm-hmm. um, for um, for students. So as as we look at at what you have, and where can people find the Gazetti? Too, because I think a lot of people may not know exactly right. where to um, find it. The Gazette is distributed in, I think, about 75 or 80 locations throughout the five cities of Southampton Roads. It's difficult to, to pinpoint a location without knowing where the person is, but mm-hmm. I'd like to give my phone number and email sure. address. Absolutely. And if any, you may. Yes, um, I can be reached at. Seven five seven four seven three nine five eight three, and the email address is H R Gazetti. That's G A Z E T I at gmail dot com. Okay, that's perfect. Now you're also going to be showing a film called Food Inc. And if I'm not mistaken, that um, is a PBS. <laughs> yes. Product, yes, yeah. it is, mm-hmm. and it is. and it, it is, is talking about um, the whole idea of all of the um, antibiotics and and things that are being done to our foods, to genomes and and so forth. You want to talk a little bit about the film? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, Food Incorporated is what about five years old now, but we <clears throat> chose it because I think it's kind of basic to the whole food problem. We're mm-hmm. facing this film documents the way our animals, our food animals are raised these days in huge windowless factories, crowded together, barely able to move around, and they're fed GMO corn. The workers don't even go into these facilities. 
Mm -hmm. On those rare occasions when they have to, they have to have to don protective clothing. So the food comes from shoots, you know, coming Mm -hmm. down the corn. So there are all kinds of problems with that. I mean, animals were intended to roam outside in the fresh air and sunshine and eat their natural diets of their choosing. Well, because of the way these animals are raised, I mean, they can't live very long in that environment, which is why they are pumped with antibiotics and hormones that keep them healthy long enough to be slaughtered. Mm -hmm. So Food Incorporated uh, shows pictures, brings that out, and talks about other problems with our food supply. Okay. And, and I, that's going to be shown um, on on Sunday at what time? Let me look at the uh, schedule. At From 2 to 3.30. From 2 to 3.30. Okay. Right. So the entire Natural Health Expo is next Sunday, August the 30th, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. There's something for every age group, mm-hmm. so you can bring your entire family at the Holiday Inn Virginia Beach, Norfolk, which is on Greenwich Road in Virginia Beach, and you can go to um, nhe 2015eventbritecom to find out more uh, information about that. There is a cost, um, but if you go online, you can find out uh, what that is. So, right, it, it's natural, just ten dollars. Okay, the Natural Health Expo again, Sunday, August thirtieth, twenty fifteen, from eleven a.m. until six p.m. I know that you guys are going to have a great um, expo, and we thank you so much yes. for joining for us here us. on another view. And um, and I know that that hopefully some people will take a look at a different form of medicine. Okay, you're <laughs> listening to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. When we come back, a conversation with human rights advocate Frederick Douglass. Stay with us. <laughs> Central Station. That's just one of the groups that are going to be performing at Africana, Virginia Beach. It's a yearly three-day celebration that celebrates family, culture, and entertainment of the African diaspora, and it's happening at the Oceanfront August 28th through 30. The historical highlight of the event is writer, orator, and abolitionist Frederick Douglass. He's here in the studio with me. Mr. Douglass, how are you? Good morning, fellow citizen. Good morning. It's good to be here. It is so good to see you, On radio again. Absolutely. Do you know about radio? Well, it was invented in 1895 by Heinrich Holtz. And uh, it was just a rumor at that time, so I had never seen radio. But I understand me speaking, this actually goes out and my fellow citizens can hear me. Yes, it is. It's a great thing, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Along with the creator of Africana, Virginia Beach, Mr. Bruce Williams. Hi, Bruce. How Hi, are you? How you doing? Good. So tell us a little bit about this year's performers and what's going to be going on. And then we're going to turn around and, and have some more conversation with Mr. Douglas. Well, here. as you can see, we, we enlisted the time machine and we went and got uh, <laughs> Brother Frederick Douglas to come up and, and be there. He'll be expounding while he's at the at the Africana. This year's Africana is uh, really a wonderful experience. We've got several things involved with the community. You know about the big acts. We've got uh, the um, uh, 
Claire Graham and Graham Central Station can function, and uh, the Roger, the um, Zap Band, they're going to be on Friday. We've got uh, the Myra Smith Experience and Earl Carter on Sunday at the 24th Street Park. Uh, we've got the uh, African Dance, the Mosaic Steel Orchestra is going to be playing, the Elements Band. We're going to have Fuzz Band out there, and the Rick Elliott Saxophonist, Butcher Brown Band, and we got you have all the this. Most of everything for we've everybody. Got, we've got at least eight food vendors this year. So bring okay. your appetite. They're going to be there with the African. We got a day party that's, that's just like taking off. Now, that one is not free, but it's kicking. It's on the beach, and, and it's called the Jazz with the Beat. <laughs> and, it's, and it's only $20, and it's on the line. You go online and get your tickets because it's going to be fun. Pepsi's sponsoring it. Um, now, tell me a little bit about how, how is Africana Virginia Beach doing? Because this is a fairly new um, um, event that's yes. been going on. So has it been growing year to year? Mm-hmm. And is it bringing – this is an event that brings people not only from Hampton Roads, but it brings people from all over the East Coast, correct? Actually, it was designed that way. Funk Fest, which is part of what we, we partner with on this weekend, making it a great weekend, has been there. And now State Farm, being State Farm Funk Fest Beach Party is a beach party. Now, they put the beach party together because we created Africana to take it from two nights of concert to a three-day festival. And our focus has been the support of the city of Virginia Beach to bring African-American middle-class families back to the beach. This was a lot of group that were college students back in the day. And there was mm-hmm. during the day we had our, our little altercation at the beach. Well, there was a taint on the beachfront. It's changed a lot just like Virginia has changed. And so what we were we proposed to do was to bring these folks to this beach to show them the new beach, including entertainment, education, cultural events that were related to not just them, but the entire beachfront crowd that came. Mm-hmm. And so our focus has been advertising out of market. I can tell you that right now, people are coming in from uh, from Raleigh, from Richmond, from D.C., Baltimore, and we've promoted that way. In fact, many of the media outlets we've used, mostly which are black media outlets, mm-hmm. have been great supporters of us, the Richmond Free Press, the Charlotte Post. The Afro has got a thing where on their Facebook page, you can put a video on it. Mm-hmm. We put a video on it. 45 minutes after that video went up, 1,000 views wow. and 175 likes, 45 minutes after it went up. <laughs> So a friend of mine I just, just talked to on my way here to the studio, she said, I was in Raleigh last week. Did somebody tell me they're coming to Virginia Beach at the end of the month? That's what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Now, now when, if, when you talk to people then who, who have come back to the beach, um, who may have had a, a less than positive impression of the beach before, after they've experienced Africana, what's the feedback you're getting? Feedback we're getting is, wow, uh, who's coming next year? Uh, I didn't believe it. I'm bringing my crew next time. Because mm-hmm. the age group we're aiming at is 35, 54 plus. Uh, they look for a good time. The beach is a wonderful place. They're family oriented. But... They want to feel comfortable. They don't want to be hounded. They want to be run up and down. And in many cases, we've got these little VIP things where they can even chill out. You know, it costs them a little bit. Chill out. The first year, we got people saying, you're doing it where? The second year was, wow, this is great. I didn't know this was good. I'm going to have to tell my folks, who's who's coming? This year, who's coming? And we're going to get a room. <laughs> so it's it's gotten that far. In fact, that's probably our challenge is, you know, being able to get people accommodations that they can afford or that are available. Uh, I We're not on the same weekend as Eastern Surfing, so I haven't had a chance to check with my hotel friends to see how we're doing. But I know folks made arrangements for certain hotels mm-hmm. months ago. Now, one of the important parts of this is the historical part. Yes. Which is why we have um, Frederick Douglass. Now, before we talk to you, Mr. Douglass, you have done different historical you brought out history in different ways yes. each year so one, one of our key ways is our culture walk it's, okay. our, it's one of the standards that we it was brand new to the beach any, anything mm-hmm. they're of uh, eight by four foot panels with historical vignettes of history of african-american history uh, much of it virginia oriented curated by dr newby alexander at the Norfolk state university uh and and they are on the boardwalk, and you encounter them as you walk up the boardwalk from 24th Street to 31st Street. Mm-hmm. We'll have those up again this year. We've made sure that our programming has included not just, uh, you know, 
what we call the African dance. We've got that. But we've got the Caribbean experience in this year uh, where the Mosaic Steel have been. And, of course, working with teens, people like Teens with a Purpose, we've tried to expand it to spoken word. Uh, we at one point had the, the Black Storytellers. We intend to have them back next year. All of this is designed to show that the African American experience is a wide and deep cultural experience. It's along with R&B and funk. It's also uh, gospel. It's also blues and jazz and, and, and Caribbean steel band and African dance and culture. And so when, we, when you walk away from our experience, hopefully you've had a chance to touch on that as well as have a great time. Now, Mr. Douglas, yes. what do you think of all of this? It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> and somebody asked me earlier, how did I get here in the 21st century? Mm-hmm. Obviously, someone opened a book. That's all you need to do to access me and to bring me to life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about being at this Africana Festival and talking about uh, the issues of the day as it relates to my time uh, in the uh, 19th century Mm -hmm. when slavery uh, and abolition and I was fighting for abolition for black people. So I'm really eager to talk to people. Not only will I be doing some of my speeches, uh, the um, what to the American slave is the black man, uh, the Haiti speech. Uh, but I'll also be uh, sitting out at my tent uh, waiting for people to come talk to me about uh, what it is to agitate. Now, when you look at slavery, because at that point, you being president, that probably wasn't even in your mindset because you were more concerned about making sure that black people were no longer in chains. That is absolutely true. Uh, I Well, let's say this. I would rather have been an abolitionist than a politician. But I was actually the first black man to be voted, uh, nominated uh, by the uh, District of uh, Kentucky uh, to be on the candidate, on the ballot as a vice president. And I read about that, and I understand that you didn't even really give your permission uh, to do that, that they kind of put you there. The people elected me. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and did you really want to run for office? I did not. Uh, like I said, I would rather uh, be working with uh, John Brown and, and Harriet Tubman and all the ones who were out on the field sacrificing uh, life, limb, uh, and property. Now, you were from my, my home state of Maryland. You lived in my hometown of Baltimore. Tuckahoe and, County. And you learned to read in Baltimore. And the woman who taught you to read caught a lot of flack for teaching you to read? Of course. Uh, Negroes were not permitted to read. And uh, you could, she actually, uh, Mrs. Auld, uh, risked her her reputation and her life uh, to teach me how to read. And of course, she helped me quite a bit. But I also stole every word, every letter I could get uh, from my uh, peers, from my the young white boys uh, that I worked with. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it was a consumption thing for me. I loved words. And every time I could, I would steal a word and I would hide it under my bed or hide it behind the barn and then go back and study. So when when people when you wrote your first book and people said, well, it couldn't have been he couldn't have written this because these words are too elegant. And how could a a former slave write an autobiography like this? How did that make you feel? Well, it's it was unbelievable uh, for to see a black man not only writing, but standing up and and delivering the true story of the brutality of slavery. Uh, And so although some might not have believed uh, what I wrote in my first autobiography, uh, once I was able to stand before audiences of abolitionists, uh, which were white and black, white and Negro, uh, then they saw the real story. I would often say, I stand before you today a thief, a robber, I stole this head, this body, from my master and ran off with them. I have seen that pious man cross and tie the hands of a female slave and lash her bare skin and justify the deeds with quotes from the Bible. So they used the Bible against us. Very powerful. And that's one of the reasons they did not want us to read. Uh, So uh, I I, I challenged myself to, to enlighten myself about my circumstance, and that freed my mind and thus freed my body. Then, when you went overseas, because after you wrote your autobiography, people were kind of mad at you. Yeah? Sure, I was a fugitive. <laughs> I certainly was, and I spent time in, in Europe, in Ireland, uh, talking about abolition, and I found many people sympathetic uh, to the cause. Uh, and it, 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 it broadened my horizons. 
Americans. And when I returned, when I was able to return and they had bought my freedom, uh, I Did came back that with a little, ironic, a little ironic that the British were the ones who actually paid for your freedom? No. Uh, once I got over there and I saw uh, the British people uh, and the Ar- people of Ireland, uh, I, I understood that the people who came to America, uh, who designed the capitalistic system, uh, were caught up in the greed uh, and the riches of this vast country that they were in. And uh, they needed somebody to uh, work and do the labor. And uh, the Negro was that person. Do you remember your very first speech, the abolitionist speech that you gave when uh, when they asked you to come speak in New York? I, think I was, was very York. tentative. I was very hesitant. And uh, Mr. William Lord Garrison yes. uh, encouraged me to to get up and speak. And uh, there was there was a long time before I was really comfortable standing before people. Uh, and then once I became comfortable, uh, people uh, accused me of. Uh, of uh, chastising them. They would say, uh, we invited you into our house, we let you sleep in our bed, and then you get up in front of a group of people and you talk about us and you scold us. Uh, but I have to speak. Uh, I, was, I was born to speak uh, and talk about abolition and the brutality of it. And so that's what I did. What do you think, um, were you able really to change hearts and minds? Well, uh, some. But it's not a matter of changing hearts and minds necessarily. Hearts and minds are going to change when they want to change. Uh, The structure of the United States, the structure of the Constitution, uh, is what we aim as the foundation for how we live in the society. And so there uh, in lied the the disagreement with me and Mr. William Law Garrison. So you and Mr. Garrison, really, you guys went two totally different ways because you, you... Uh, continue to believe in the Constitution and that it could still work sure. for black, for Negroes at that time, black people. But he was pretty much, I don't think any kind of institution works. He was for throwing the Constitution out. I was for keeping the Constitution. All the words are there. All the words are there today. That same Constitution in the 19th century, those words have not been changed with the exception of a few amendments. Uh, and it's just our lack of knowledge of what the what the Constitution says and holding our government accountable uh, for those words uh, that makes us uh, free or not free. So, Mr. Douglas, since you've been since you're here, I assume you've been reading some of the newspapers and seeing some of the things that have been happening in today's society. What do you think about what is happening today? Does it dismay you? That it dismays it dismays me that uh, we have become so apathetic. Uh, over a number of years that we are just waking up to uh, one of my favorite words, agitate. Uh, The other thing, I get a lot of questions about this issue uh, revolving around the Confederate flag. Uh, And so uh, my view on that is it's really a symptom of uh, slavery, of uh, prejudice, of racism. Uh, And I would give you this analogy. Uh, Suppose there was this great oak full of leaves and these leaves were represented by uh, confederate flags and so if you strip that uh, great oak with all its leaves would it kill the tree Hmm. no you would have to pull up the root you would have to pull racism up by the roots Uh, anything going on in society today that is still prevalent is because we've only stripped away the the superficial nature of what we are looking at and we have not gotten down to the roots of racism in our society the structural uh things that cause us to or enable people to uh, suppress uh the negro so mr douglas what did you want society american society to do in terms of acceptance of the black man once he was free well first of all Freedom means that the black man or any man will be free to make his own decisions. Uh, Once you're free, you're not uh, a slave anymore. But if you still work uh, for someone who tells you when to work, where to work, when to come to work, for what to work, uh, then you are still a slave. And so that's another reason that uh, one of the other points with Mr. Garrison that I parted my ways, I wanted to be free. I wanted to set my own time clock uh, and set my own course and set my own legacy. And so that's that's uh, what freedom is all about. 
and we should embrace that completely and without uh, any uh, any exceptions. Then you also supported women's rights. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there were, uh, if it were not for my wife Annie, uh, I would not uh, have been able to purchase my freedom. And other women who worked uh, in the in the suffragette movement, uh, who uh, worked in the underground work railroad, uh, these women uh, coddled. Uh, the people who were running away from slavery, and they, they, I, I really owed them uh, that, mm -hmm. to stand up for them. Now, I have to ask you, Mr. Douglas, because you were a bit of a flanderer <laughs> in terms of the women, I understand. Well, I, uh, I, I was married to uh, Anne, who gave me five children, and I uh, stood by her until her death. And then I got married uh, to uh, Miss Helen Pitts. Now, but during your marriage to Anna, were you, was, it, was everything all smooth all the time? Well, I was traveling quite a bit. I was uh, traveling abroad. I was uh, speaking engagements. And women often flocked and said, oh, look at this great man speaking. I've never seen a black man speak this way. Uh, and so there were temptations. But uh, I look at uh, my life as uh, one uh, people held me in high regard. Uh, my wife held me in high regard. Uh, and I uh, owe all uh, a lot to her. Uh, for giving me five wonderful children. Of course, one of my daughters uh, passed away early in life. But my children did very well. Two of my sons uh, ended up in the 54th Regiment and fought for this country, uh, and I'm proud of that. And my daughter uh, stayed with me until the end, uh, making sure that I kept my books and, and so forth and so on. So so what? tell us one thing that you want people to know about you that you think has gotten lost in the history of what's been told about you? Well, first of all, uh, the questions I've been asked when someone opens a book and brings me forward to the 21st century, they're making comparisons uh, of how things are in the 21st century compared to uh, how things were in the 19th century. And so as long as we can make that distinction, uh, I really know nothing of the 21st century except what people tell me. Uh, and so I can make those uh, characterizations uh, with, uh, you know, a grain of salt. Uh, but what I set out to do was to help the black man see that you are uh, a full citizen of this country. The 14th Amendment, first, uh, first chapter, uh, guarantees that you are born in this country, that you are an American citizen, and you have every right to be here, and that you should stay here. There was a great uh, commotion about... Uh, at one time that they were going to send us all back to Africa. And I stood up and said, uh, we choose not to go back to Africa. We were born here and we shall stay here mm. because we are American citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, we appreciate you being here. And I'd like to talk just a moment with uh, Mr. Nathan Richardson, um, who brought you <laughs> forth through the book. <laughs> and just to say, Nathan, first of all, thank you for being here. And I want to know a little bit about how much you had to study and what was your methodology for learning about uh, Mr. Douglas? Well, um, first of all, I have to give uh, the challenge uh, that I got from uh, my sister, uh, who does uh, storytelling, uh, Sheila Arnold. And she came to me. I've been doing poetry for a number of years, spoken word. And she said, Nathan, you really ought to do a historical character. And she really challenged me to do that. And I ended up choosing Frederick Douglass. And, uh, and it was a godsend because we have a lot in common. He and I have a lot in common. He loved poetry, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. He was a great orator. And then secondly, uh, I guess I had been prepared all these years of listening to WHRL and listening to Clay Jenkinson do his, his interpretation of, uh, of, uh, of that character. <laughs> and so I, I, it, it just put me right in the position to pick up that uh, mantle <laughs> and, and go forward. And that's mm -hmm. how I have modeled uh, my presentation of Frederick Douglass. Yeah. So have you done, a, did you have to read a lot? Did you have to study a lot? About oh, absolutely. And it's an, ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing journey of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, of course, I do performances uh, where I'm talking, I'm doing speeches. Uh, but the difficult part, of course, is when you are open yourself up to questions from the audience. And so you don't know where those questions are coming from. And you definitely have to uh, be studied, uh, learn, not just what Frederick Douglass said, but what other people said about Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people are just calling me saying, I got another book for you. And, and so I said, yeah, I'm coming to get it uh, because I want to 
want to read uh, what people are saying. Can you remember one of the most unusual questions you've gotten? Anything that just kind of struck you like, wow, really? <laughs> wow. Well, I had a young person. And I love young people. I do a lot of youth activism, of course. And I was at, well, this is one of my first uh, presentations of Frederick Douglass at Paul D. Camp Community College. And this family of young kids, uh, three, uh, eight, and 11, and the eight-year-old asked me uh, about the cane that I got from uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, his wife after his assassination, he asked me, did I still have that cane? And I said, of course I do. <laughs> so, uh, so that was my first uh, question that, uh, that I was really, uh, really uh, just, just excited to receive from an audience. Remember? We've got about three minutes. Can you do something really short, um, just some, from a part of a speech that Frederick Douglass said or, or a saying sure, from him? Sure, sure. Um, this was uh, the opening of the speech, uh, What to the Negro is the 4th of July? Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why have I been called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar, to confess the benefits, to express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting in your independence to us? I am not included in the pale of your glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. Wow. You really just get right <laughs> into that character. That is awesome. <laughs> Bruce, tell us again when uh, Africana Virginia Beach is. Africana kicks off on Friday at 2 p.m. at the 24th Street Park. That's our opening ceremony. And then goes on through to the evening when they will be switching to the 23rd Street stage for Fuzz Band. I'm sorry, Confunction at 8 p.m. And then the Zap Pan at 9.30. You can see Frederick Dulles on Saturday at 4 p.m. at the 24th Street stage. We kick back off at 12 noon on, on Saturday. And again, go through the evening with uh, events of different proportions. We have the Teens with a Purpose at 4.30 and the, uh, uh, Anthony Rosano and the, and the Conqueros at 6 p.m. And then we end up with Larry Graham at uh, 9.15. 9.15 that evening. That's right. With, uh, I think uh, Jocelyn Best leads off in front of him. And then Sunday, we'll have a full slate of uh, entertainment starting at 2 p.m., Jamie Parker, Chosen Generations, Marcus Hickens, Hicks and the M.O. Band, and, of course, the Caribbean, then ending up with Earl Carter and the Myra Smith Experience. And Mr. Douglas will be on also at uh, 7 p.m. That on is, August the 30th. That is correct. Is and that you correct? can find all of this on www.virginiabeach, excuse me, africanavirginiabeach.com. Okay, that is fantastic. So we look forward to um, everyone going down and having a great time. This festival is for everyone everybody and we really want people to know black that. history is american history. black history is american history thank you guys so much for joining us we really do appreciate that and we want to thank you for joining us for this edition of another view and do me a favor and share this podcast of this show or any of our other archive programs with a friend go to anotherviewradio.org and just download the podcast and while you're there you can sign up for our eview newsletter it's a once a week reminder of upcoming programs. And you can also find us on iTunes and you can also stream us live every Friday at noon if you go to anotherviewradio.org. So those of you who are watching, you can see Mr. Douglas is all made up in his costume. He really is Mr. Douglas. Next week is the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. We talk with those who live through it and find out what's going on in their lives now. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Kamaria Mason answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Make it a wonderful weekend, everyone. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view. <laughs> <laughs>